Greetings, everyone. I came with a speech to read as an introduction. Uh, for those who don't know Dave, uh, Professor Dave Reed is coming from the University of Cape Town. Uh, he, for, for many years, he has been working in igneous petrology-related projects, but he has also worked or done a lot of things in economic geology. And besides that, uh, later on, after, uh, I hope it's not after your retirement, he moved to more of heritage-related activities. So I wanted to read all the things that I hear, so he stopped me saying that I have to tell you a, a very short story of how we actually met with Dave. Uh, I was working for one of the mines in Caltonville. Uh, this was uh, mid-2000, if I'm not mistaken. And during this time, I was coming from underground. I was tired. I, I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to do a master's degree. So I, uh, I sent him an email. And he organized a field trip with the honor students coming from uh, UCT. And he told me that he will be coming to visit me at the mine. So uh, while I was tired there in the mine, he came with a bottle of Coke. And uh, he told me, before we say anything, you have to make sure you drink up what I have bought for you. So we went back to the parking lot, and with this started a, a very uh, a good relationship between me and, and him. So I have been working with him for, for almost 10 years at the moment, and we have been doing a lot of things. We published our first paper together, I think, in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's a pleasure to have him here, and uh, I hope he will also be present tomorrow when I'm also giving me, uh, the talk on machine learning. So Dave, welcome here, and we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Okay, live camera action. <clears throat> okay. So is this a Spielberg uh, direction? They call it Jura Heritage Park or something like that. Okay. Well, hopefully the lights are, are sufficiently low and you'll be able to see the sort of subscript there. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, there's a variety of ways that you can spell and pronounce desiccate. And if I say decasit uh, throughout, just forgive me, all right? Uh, there's two C's and one S, like desiccator. I'm sure we all know a desiccator. But um, over the, the last few years, I've given this talk, and it's been the ancient rocky wilderness. I thought to Jasper Knight and Stefan, called it the ancient rocky wilderness. And then there was another one, which was the ancient desert wilderness in the IGC. But to me, it's a place where I grew up. Uh, not strictly speaking, I grew up in a place called New Zealand. But I just put down the bottom here, you may enter the Richtersfeld as a child, boy or girl, and if you survive, you will return a geologist slash warrior slash ninja, depending on you. And this was given to me uh, by Professor John de Villiers. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a director of the PRU. He succeeded Henno Martin, another sort of part of our geoheritage. And of course, with uh, Jerry Singer, again, part of Stellenbosch geoheritage, they wrote, which again is part of geoheritage, the so-called Richtersfeld Memoir, which came out in 1959. And you can probably see there's a couple of snapshots, and this is, of course, a very, very photogenic uh, slide show. Lots of pictures, and I have run out of time. Uh, but those people who haven't been there, this is a very good start for you uh, on your career uh, in terms of Jira Heritage. Um, there, for example, is David Bell as an honor student. He's now a professor, Saatchi chair at the University of Nelson Mandela, and, uh, and so on. Um, but you can probably see it's pretty dry. Um, it is the decasset edge of South Africa. And you can see, not only is it dry, but you can see the orange is also dry. And there's a whole very interesting story about the fact that this valley was so big once, when one, one wanders. Uh, Where is the Richtersfeld? It's, of course, you can't get further away without leaving the country, uh, in the case of Joburg. And it could well be on your empty bucket list, whereas quite a lot of the UCT graduates and even the schools. Certainly my daughters paddled down the Orange River as part of their matric geography class. And uh, that was pretty cool. Um, and here's a sort of a slight blow up. And you see that the Richtersfeld, of course the boundaries can vary depending on your, on your coordinates. 
but you can see it's largely geoheritage already. Uh, it's a sand park, it's a transfrontier sand park, and of course a World Heritage Site, and of course you can see that the Namib Desert Park, or the old diamond area number two, and part of the Spirkebet as well, sort of forms the Namibian border north of the orange, and of course there's a big question mark as what's going to happen to the west. Um, here's another picture just to sort of depict some of the topography, the landscapes, the, the scenery, so to, so to speak, uh, which is probably the thing that catches your eye, um, everybody's eye probably. Um, that the, uh, the area of the Richtersfeld, of course, you can see, is a mountain desert in one side, the so-called eastern Richtersfeld, and then you have the coastal plain. Of course, this is very important because a serious number of carats of diamonds are one out of there. Um, it is featured already. It, it is probably one of the sort of top geological sites in Africa. This is the cover to the book that came out at the IGC. There was a chapter on the Richtersfeld I wrote there. Uh, it also figured prominently uh, when two ge ge geography professors from Witz, Stefan and Jasper um, co-edited Landscapes and Landforms of South Africa. Um, and it sort of got me into uh, landscape development, geomorphology, evolutionary geomorphology, and all sorts of things like that. And then the great debate, I thought the Witz debate was pretty cool, but the great debate about the origin and the age of the escarpment and the advent of new thermochronology. I mean, Grant, you've got to do thermochronology. I mean, it's like potassium argon, you know, you've got to do it. There's a lot more people interested in that than maybe the age of the, the Witz or something like that. Anyway, the, um, this book by Stefan and Jasper, had the who's who, if I could call rocks who, but um, the Richtersfeld um, figured prominently there, and I'm sure some of you have got this book already. If not, um, this is a very good start. But of course, you know that geoheritage sort of permeates uh, into what we call ecotourism, and uh, geological colleagues, most of you are probably familiar with Geological Journeys, and then the, the sequel off the beaten track, and of course here, after a couple of conversations with Nick over a few wines, he said, you know, the Richtersfeld really didn't, there's no highways there, that's a good start, because you know, basically you can't drive there easily. But he certainly added the Richtersfeld uh, dramatically in the second edition. Most recently, and I want to plug this book, um, I mean, John is another retired colleague from UCT, and, um, and he very uh, uh, kindly gave me a copy of his book, uh, which, so this is a, an official book launch uh, for this, which is basically Geoheritage of the Cape, which some of the students, I know some of my uh, UCT students are here, they remember them in the first year geology guidebook, which basically is turned into a, a beautiful um, colour version of this. But what is geoheritage, what is cultural heritage, what is heritage sites and so on, I've just decided to sort of tune in on some of the, um, the wording particularly the World Heritage Site, which is south of the sand park. It's all about bugs and flowers and other things like that, but of course we can put the geological overlay on that. And also, 2,000 year old transhumans partial livelihood. You know that has to be Jasper. So basically, um, this is all about the cultural uh, landscape, which, as you know, most geologists don't have people in their photographs, and I'm no exception to that. But obviously we have to um, ultimately be aware of the fact that there are people out there and they have a profound influence not only on myself but also on the geology. Uh, Geoheritage, now what is so special? And again, um, you'll probably see later, I'll be giving this talk to all sorts of retirement homes, schools, <laughs> outreach projects, uh, Botsock, the, the Nat Cape Natural History, I mean John Rogers is doing all of those ones, uh, and so on. But certainly, at the other level, when you have government departments and, and, and so on, um, and the people with real money, why do we actually need to have a sand park? Why, and why do we need to put, have a geological overlay and so on and so on? So what is in the Richtersfeld that is, makes it unique? Just like you had to justify the heritage route, which is a spectacular road from Swaziland to Barberton. Clap, clap, clap. So near Protozoic Snowball Earth, the Cryogenian Caicos Formation is there. It's the only place in this country where we do have the Cryogenian in that type of environment. The Cambrian Precambrian Boundary is another cool place. So we don't have the PT boundary near Pier, but you know, we can't have everything. Um, then, of course, 
It shows ongoing geological processes, so it becomes more of an instructional and, and a sense of wonder and a sense of uh, discovery. Has a rifted margin, it's an arid, great escarpment coastal plain, and we'll touch sides of that, both photogenically and analytically. And of course, uh, big bucks, although as people can argue, maybe the locals and the, the heritage associated with the big bucks really never got there, but it is a world-class diamond deposit. Natural beauty, now again, I'm ho hopefully I'm in sort of geology anonymous here, where we all go out there and we just don't appreciate we just thought, oh, well, there's the fold and thrust belt, and therefore the sort of uh, and, and the PT boundary. Shut the F up and just appreciate the view. That's us. So natural beauty. Certainly a lot of people sort of come and do geology because of the, you know, on a holiday or something, they saw something. Wow, Fisher River Canyon. Cool. Drakensberg. Cool. Let's go and do a course. And, of course, it has, as I said, Transfrontier, World Heritage Site, geotourism, big deal. And we should engage more in the geotourism industry. And I know a lot of colleagues of mine have actually become geotour guides, uh, both in person as well as generating books like, like Nick Norman. And of course, it is a place that has been historical for natural resources, diamonds, renewable energy maybe, solar power, those things that are starting up in the desert. And of course, it's a great place to teach geology, as all the students I've taken. Um, but for me, it's not necessarily just um, those things in the first list. It's all about one's own personal history. All of us have a personal history. All of us have a story to tell. I'm sure some of you remember when you had to stand up with a beer in your hand and said, I did geology for cause, and so on. And the highlight of this thing, non-academic and academic. And it's all about the people that affected my life. And I met John de Villiers, Jerry Singer, and uh, von Parkstrom, and they basically uh, said, Good luck. And you saw that first slide. If you don't come back with a Land Rover in one piece, don't come back. <laughs> um, of course, we know that it's a place where we can, we can understand the difference between stamp collecting and real science, causal and historical. And um, then, of course, um, student field trips. I mean, you always take your kids to Barberton and they come back totally beneficiated. Conference field excursions. I've taken lots of people around the world. Uh, there and didactic romantic. I remember one of my students, she came in through the BA door, but she didn't have enough matric points to go in science. And she did a BA in English literature in the first year. She did geology as an extra. It's not you, Pia, someone else. But she did a course called Romance to Realism. And of course, most of us probably think this is a bad thing for girls to experience. No, it is two types of literary genre. <laughs> Whereas we are didactic. We explain all the geology and we talk about fold and thrust belts. And then the romantics tell us to shut up and just appreciate it. And we know that our geoheritage could be sort of outward as well as inward. And so certainly uh, the romantic aspect of geology is quite important in order to attract others and to justify our sort of 24-7 experience. This one sort of is where the term desiccate came from. This is um, Cosmos, based on Odyssey, uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was running a timeline. If you look at this, there's way back. And it stops basically when, Glenn, you're going to retire, about 2040 or something like that. <laughs> and basically what's doing is that the, the thermal effect of global warming is where the average temperature rises, but it rises variably across the, the, uh, across the world, and the rate of rise is different. So you can see where the Richtersfeld is. I mean, this could almost be a locality map of the Richtersfeld. And so bearing in mind the amount of CO2, anthropogenic CO2 is going to be warming, the hotspot, the place that's going to get hotter and faster is the Richtersfeld. And so something like this, it's worthwhile going back to episode 12 and run this entire video with Neil deGrasse uh, talking in the background. Um, the geoheritage is already encapsulated in books. I've come up here and talked about possible books in, in exploration geology with, uh, and, and sort of brainstorming with Glenn and others about this. Uh, and books can also be part of the geoheritage. Um, those people who have seen this book, Graham Williamson, is a spectacular book. If you want to know about bugs, you want to know about plants, all the things that I don't know about, go and look at that, as well as the second edition. Spectacular. Geology sucks, but then, of course, um, they piecemeal, and of course, some of the, the latest uh, geologic research wasn't encapsulated in, the, um, in that work. 
Um, and he sort of gave a, a small uh, bridge version to hand out when people registered at the gate. Um, we have other ones which uh, maps, of course. Uh, Tracks and trails of the Richtersfeld is a pretty cool one. And that, of course, um, uh, you've got to keep in mind that uh, when de Villiers and Sunga did their mapping, they were kids in the 1940s, and they were given the Richtersfeld to map, and they walked over it, literally walked over it. And many of those trails are now basically encapsulated in this, written by a couple of um, entrepreneurs to indicate that um, you are walking in the footsteps of giants, so to speak. Um, this is one which a former student of mine, Paul Macy, has basically added the geology to the basement of the Fisher River Canyon. And Peter Slingsby came out with a map as part of the Slingsby map series. And now you can walk this and actually look at the geology. But I won't recommend you to do the sand park walk because they walk quickly and they don't let you stop and look at the geology, take photographs. So you'd rather do it. We used to do it as a third year trip. You'd go down and, and really discover. And this is the, the section that all the third year kids used to walk down, walk to the Sulphur Springs Trail, and walk back out in a day. And they came back. It's definitely geologists. And of course, my geo heritage is basically this book, my copy, special copy of the geology of the Richtersfeld, one pound, 15 shillings, and sixpence. The map was uh, something like one pound, three and fourpence, and something like that. And the most amazing thing about it is that it was published by the government printer on beautiful parchmentized paper. And of course, that was very, very cheap paper for the Michaelis Art School. And they bought all the copies of the Richtersfeld member, turned them over in their drawers, and used them as back for painting classes. And when I went there, what are you doing with my maps? Anyway, um, the, I'm, I'm also pushing uh, the, the summer school next year. Um, John, Nick Norman, and I, and Sherrod, because you know Sherrod has to be part of this, um, are giving a, a talks, a series of talks as part of summer school. And of course, this is a little bit of a sort of update in the dry run on the uh, on the talk I'll be giving there. Anyway, just to sort of look back in the past, I mean, this is mainly for Sherrod's benefit, which he does like un unearthing old documents and showing what they did 100 years ago or more. And this was the frontispiece of that, and it's the sort of thing you know you want to go back there to go to the same place. Um, but I also like to, to, to punt some of the people. I mean, John and, and Jerry didn't do it alone. And a lot of his support staff were from Avamberland. You can think of Avamberland as like a jungle compared to the Richtersfeld. But without them, I don't think they would have done any geology. Especially this guy here, who's got a 18 pound sledgehammer. And uh, this is the field of granite, which I did my PhD on. And you certainly needed that sledgehammer. Here's a picture, again, another, his, his tracker and his companion was a part Nama from the, uh, from the cultural landscape around the corner uh, in the southeastern Richtersfeld. And without him, certainly John would never have come out alive. And they walked over these incredible spiky mountains. These sort of mountains does, does indicate that I was born and bred in New Zealand where the landscape scale is, is like this. A very short length scale and a very short time scale. Okay? When I came to the other end of the earth, so to speak, of course your length scales are sort of the Karoo. Sorry, Peter, the Karoo is just like that. Nothing. Sorry. But anyway, uh, and the time scale was billions of years. So, except for places like the Barberton, but certainly the Richtersfeld, where you seem to have a New Zealand length scale, but it has an African time scale. Because as you will see, these mountains were here 100 million years ago, and they've been like that for the last 100 million years. This river has done hardly anything to that landscape. So that's obviously something which is going to figure prominently in the Geo heritage. And the closest I could get to where John went was simply coming down in a canoe. And there's a picture that's in the director's film memoirs he took. Incidentally, his entire photo collection, all his rolls of film, that he took with a Leica Practica 35mm camera is still in the archives in the library at UCT. And so I took this picture out from that and got a digital copy. And then this is the original. So I can say between that and that, there's very little exhumation. And you know that already. Well, anyway, what is so important about the geological history and so on? Well, 
I innocently went into this. Okay, the landscapes of South Africa. It's part of the great escarpment. And I wrote my first draft, and it got absolutely decimated by Mike DeWitt and an unknown reviewer, which could have been Spike McCarthy or could have been uh, his encapsulation. And it just tore me to shreds and said, go back and read the literature on the scarp and landscape evolution in South Africa. And that was a, a, a part of my geoheritage. It actually got me into geomorphology and landscape evolution and this time scale and this length scale. And uh, a lot of you probably are aware of the fact that this escarpment is very old. There's been, of course, people in this very room who said it's very young, 30 million years or younger. But there's all the thermochronologists have come back with piles and piles of data to indicate that this escarpment was there 80 million years ago and it hasn't moved and it hasn't changed. So you've got an ancient, relict, exhumed sort of landscape. And the other end of the end member is New Zealand where it's happening daily. <coughs> you have beach ridges which are 2,000 meters above sea level since the Pleistocene. Scary place. Anyway, the important thing about the Richtersfeld is that it's right at that point where the escarpment gets breached by the biggest river in southern Africa. Um, and so, again, without uh, hopefully being uh, predicting, uh, uh, sort of repeating myself, bimodal elevation, vast interior plateau, bordered by the great escarpment. So it looks like the Richtersfeld is a great place to go and study the escarpment. It hasn't been studied. And to cut a long story short, and I'll probably run out of time before we take this away, is that the Richtersfeld is a place where a tremendous amount of interesting, let's say, landscaping can take place. Not necessarily the age of the Pan-African and the intrusion of the granites and all that sort of classic geology, but I mean landscape development. A lot of the thermochronology has been done all around the southern, eastern, around south of the Richtersfeld, and of course also north in Namibia. Oh, missed that one now, but... I'd say basically this high elevation of Africa probably started at the time um, Gondwana land was a supercontinent and the initiation of the breakup of Gondwana land was plume driven as well as um, passive margin driven. So you generated uh, relatively high but you could well have had um, augmentation because the, the Beaufort fan is this huge massive thick package of rocks that were sort of uh, derived from the Cape Fall Belt so that must have had a very high elevation the first place, um, and then of course you know you are a supercontinent, you know, far from the old um, Gondwana land passive margins. So this whole place must have been pretty high, at about 180 and then beyond. So there's, a, there's an aspect of, of um, sedimentation, plume, and rifted margins all contributing to the, um, to the elevation. And then of course landscape development is all about rivers eroding, and of course this is where Spike came up with this idea of the Karoo River, and the Kalahari River, and then flowing basically towards the Richtersfeld, and then of course the Zambezi, Okavango, Limpopo. The interesting I learned from this is that the Limpopo Delta is ginormous. It makes the Zambezi look small, but you know that Zamb Zambezi is a huge river and the Limpopo is a small river. So it was very fascinating, and um, I think it's worth looking at. Typical sort of elevation profiles, Great Escarpment, Coastal Lowfeld, and so on. And what will Basically, this is an introduction to some of the landforms and landscapes of the Richtersfeld per se. And it's really part of this. But also, if you go along the coast, you basically have a situation whereby you can see within the basement lithologies and the, and the topography the ancestral Orange River that, flew out, uh, that flowed out of the Elephant River mouth. So just a quick uh, thermochronometry 101. Just in case people don't believe thermochronology because they basically have proven Partridge wrong, McCarthy wrong, Burke wrong. And that's sacrilege in this, in this room to say things like that. <laughs> Sorry guys, but I mean, this is, I mean, some of your former students have basically been proving you wrong. This is mainly Roderick Brown and his team in Glasgow. This basically shows you what fishing track ages turn about landscape of evolution and also the so-called uranium helium techniques of landscape evolution. And basically tells you how old the surface landscapes are and tells you something about the uplift rate and whether or not you have a steady state or a passive situation which was once very active like New Zealand way back. Uh, a typical similar uh, simple uplift rate, you get a linear relationship and you get a situation where the ages change systematically from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. 
But if you get a situation where you get a kink, then you know the uplift rate has changed over time. And to cut a long story short, the uplift rate was very high back in the Cretaceous, it's been very low during the Cenozoic. Um, these are a couple of diagrams to show you where all the work has been done in the offshore basins and of course the online, and it's mainly because of the oil industry that have sort of driven this. The Richter's field has sort of lagged behind. One or two former students and former colleagues did a traverse up the orange from outside the Richter's field through to Akrabis to try and find out something about that, that ev the evolution of the Orange River Canyon um, and so on. Uh, again, uh, Roderick Brown's group um, three um, trajectories across the, the Markwellan escarpment and basically they were trying to make the distinction between the various landscape evolutionary geomorphology models one, two and three, sorry one, two and three and basically saying that the thermochronology response of each of these types of uh, rifted margin and, and exposure and denudation can be indicated in the three different signatures and therefore to cut a long story short they're basically thinking this one is the big deal you can see quite a lot of the sampling has been done, taking place in the southwestern Cape, the southern Cape, and so on. Very little in the Richter's field per se, and I think it's, it's long overdue to go in there and look at some, some of these exposures. Some of you, maybe students in the audience, will want to get into thermochronometry uh, and then sort of go and do the Richter's field. Get your permit to work in the sand park, and then the rest will be history. Um, this is a busy diagram, and I'm not going to sort of explain it, but all I'm saying is that a lot of these sort of uh, evaluations of the thermochronology tells you that the time when erosion took place and the relief was generated, the Cape Fold Belt is no, ex ex no exception, and the chances are that your Drakensberg escarpment and the other escarpments that are up in the Barberton area are all similar in having sort of Cretaceous erosion histories and largely being relic and almost passive for the last 80 million years. Again, I'll skip that, I'm running out of time, but basically, um, I can have geomorphologists in this room and talk about well, how our escarpments are formed. And when, when Carl was a student, he probably had to learn about Lester King and all these sort of escarpment erosion surfaces, and, which is all bollocks, unfortunately, but some of his students basically were sufficiently motivated to disprove him. And that's the whole point of the geoheritage, the whole point of get people thinking, get people, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong, but that motivation is an advancement in science. To cut a long story short, this diagram came out of John Decker's PhD thesis and basically plateau degradation. The escarpment that we see was where it started. It didn't start in the coast and go inland like this does. Very interesting and therefore something for you to mull over. So the denudation rates, again, this diagram is a bit busy, but certainly way back, the land was going up quick and it was being worn down very quick and massive sedimentary basins have been formed offshore. So that's basically the sort of bottom line here, this high in Cretaceous, low in tertiary, particularly in the West Coast. Um, now again, another very um, uh, sort of pile of text, but I think probably the best thing is that the landscape of Southern Africa records a response of surface processes, epigenetic uplift and climate since the time of Gondwana breakup. Dominant effect of lithology is down wearing, not back wearing. And the unique history of changes and again, ancient relic landscape. And this is uh, Roderick Brown's group saying that this is how the South Atlantic opened and then you had a reactivation of the continental margin. Um, obviously this is probably 130 when the South Atlantic started to propagate from south to north. And then of course um, you had um, plate reconstruction or plate uh, movement changes in vectors and you had some reactivation in order to generate uh, the fission track and, and um, uranium helium profiles. Um, anyway, our closest approach to bedrock geology is shown here. I think the important thing is obviously there's a whole pile of different rock types, but there's Pan-African on one side and the pre-Pan-African on the other side. And the, the important thing is that the landscape is controlled, obviously by that tectonic uplift and so on and so on, but then lithological features were controlling how high the mountain was, how big the mountain was, and how short-lived or long-lived the mountain was. And so you can almost predict that the, um, and you probably know if you've already seen the sort of like a Google Earth picture or a landscape picture, that it's really a, a, a division of east and west, very different topographies. Uh, and it's really controlled by the, the geology of the bedrock. Here the Pan-African, 
with uh, immediately laboring African granites. And over here, you've got a hodgepodge of three origins, Orange River, the Namaqua, and um, the overprint of the Pan-African. So these are all ancient rocks. These are all relatively younger rocks, and it's shown in this type of, um, of history. If we actually overlay the geology onto the, the terrain, you can actually see that obviously these great big blue rocks is these huge thick quartzites of the Stinkfontein Formation forms the highest mountains in the spine. But the interesting thing about it's not just a simple step. It's an extremely uh, sort of irregular stepwise escarpment. And interestingly, because of the orange, the oranges actually back wore the escarpment, so there's an escarpment on both sides. So you don't actually have an interior plateau. You basically have um, a back-facing escarpment, a retro escarpment, an exhumed escarpment, and of course a, um, a fore escarpment. And so uh, when I tried to emulate a geomorphologist, I decided to try and um, subdivide the landscape into various terrains. Orange River Valley itself. And of course, a lot of people ask me, why is there a big bend in the Orange River? Okay, you got another hour? No, okay. So the west, the coastal plain, there must have been some sort of escarpment retreat because even rocks of soft and hard have all been worn back to the first step of the escarpment. Here, for example, is a huge 30-kilometer uh, Kubus batholith. Half of it has been worn out, and so you have the ancient sea cliffs, sort of, and this rock is very hard. So you've had to have a situation whereby you had the escarpment, certainly a component retreating. Over here, you've got a lot of metasediments, which are, are very uh, fissile. They're schists, and they're carbonates, and they're quite soft. And so you can see that the, the Kubus, the remnant of the Kubus, is in fact the big buttress of the escarpment or the coastal plain sort of coming out into the west. And so what I did was try to put together a series of digital elevation profiles and then sort of look at the coastal plain. The escarpment is composite in the sense that it has a, a central and an east and then you have the so-called <laughs> Karoo Plateau where you actually go down into the cover sequence whereas the underlying basement is actually topographically higher. So very interesting. And then, of course, along the tunnel, basically showed you this type of composite terrain and all these big valleys are glacial valleys of the, of the Dwyker. And I think some of you are aware of the fact that the glaciation was in part plateau, Piedmont, and valley. And all those basal valleys is where the ancestral rivers of the Orange flowed and was basically bent because of some of the uh, glacial landscapes like a glacial landscapes. And certainly in, the, in this one here, the so-called uh, Springbok Flucht, and I'll show you a couple of pics, uh, you can still see the, the Dwyker still preserved. Okay, and the rest of this is photographs. Um, here's a picture in 1974 when I started my PhD. The Orange River flooded its banks. It's one of the highest floods in living memory. Um, to the right, you've got, if anybody's actually crossed that border, you know that the river is a little thin thing normally. The river actually went right over this bridge, flooded everything, even the cop shop and the hotel. But you notice that the um, interesting thing about this is that this is Dwyker and this is Nama. This is an ancient glacial valley. It goes north-south, the, the orange comes in and immediately turns right angles to follow its old ancestral glacial valley. Um, again, you have situations whereby this is um, from my old mentor, Charles Cotton, who is a geomorphologist extraordinaire, where you have a retro arc or a retro scarp where this is um, basically an exhumed uh, back facing scarp, and the uplifted zone is actually the stuff that's lower. Sorry, the uplifted zone is slower. Um, the canyon changes quite dramatically. Uh, based on mythologies. These are sort of young granites, and this, this, this was in the actual IGC uh, calendar of 2016. And you note also that the river is actually quite small. It doesn't occupy the entire bed. Probably a better picture is, is this one here. Um, here you've got the bedrock, and here's those little orangey Karoo valleys, Dwyker valleys, and the big Piedmont, which is now the Alsenkir uh, table grape um, plantation. And you see, you come out of the um, of what we call the eastern composite terrain and the landscapes, the sort of hard rocks, and you go into the... Um, and basically, 
the, as the river flows over the Karoo, it probably reminds you of what these rivers looked like back when the Karoo was covering the whole supercontinent. Here's, a, for me, the best example of a starved river system. This is the Shambok Gorge. Some people have drowned down here, unfortunately, and sort of gone on canoes and things like that. But it's very seldom that this river is ever full for any length of time. And so one argues that, I mean, back in the Cretaceous, this river was moving with sort of levels much higher. <coughs> right at the sort of micro landscape scale, you get these incredible straths. Um, and these straths were important to the alluvial diamond people. And I recall Jens Jacobs, who was chief geologist at, at CDM, flew a microlite with a camera right down doing his PhD. Now everybody does it with drones. So this is the effect of runoff. Um, this is a star river system. This whole river was actually obviously cut by a much larger high runoff. Um, the the microstrath landscape is the place where you find diamonds. So a lot of people will be very interested in looking at these types of places. Um, the bedrock structure, here's a couple of former students, and um, basically they're canoeing down a river in February. And uh, you can see these dikes. These are dikes that are going north-south as the river's going east-west, right at that point the river turns at right angles and runs along the structure. So glacial valleys and basement structure is basically a simple answer to why you've got that huge deviation in the orange river. Um, the, the lithologies vary quite dramatically. You've got young granites intruding volcanics and these are basically teaching places where you said, well, you want to see a granite contact in 3D? There it is. Here you've got a situation where we're sitting on the top of Tibersberg looking east and you can see this is um, Pan-African granites and you've got the Karoo sitting about 1,000 metres below you. Um, here you've got three terrains. You've got granite, you've got um, deformed granites and you've got quartzite. So you would actually subdivide these terrains. Um, the nice thing about the, uh, the Orange River, it cuts through a lot of these ancient terrains and you can see the geology in 3D. And this is waiting for someone to go and do a PhD. You can't drive there. You either have to swim or fly or paddle. And uh, you can walk and this will be your domain. You will certainly come out a ninja after this if you survive. Um, and you can see the ancient rocks, the Orange River group, which are isoclinally folded. They make the Cape Fall Belt look simple, I think. Um, and so, again, uh, you've got these uh, spectacular instructive exposures. The origin, the ancient origin, is, is basically showing mountains. Now, these are two billion year old rocks. They look like they're sort of like the Southern Alps or the European Alps, but they're basically exhumed relic landscapes that were eroded and created these types of structures um, during the Cretaceous. Here's another interesting one where you can get the refoliation and the, re, the repositioning with subsequent origines. Here's, for example, is the Rosanka Big Quartzites, which are the oldest rocks, and then they've been intruded by granites, and then they've been overlain by the Pan-African. And then we know that this contact here, during the inversion stage of the Pan-African, was a transgressive tensional, transitional origin. And basically, a lot of these sort of first order structures are now being re rotated into Pan-African structures. So superimposed origins, two, th three origins superimposed upon each other. So the, those people who are really into structure can have a great... The terrain analysis is based on topography and you can basically see flatlands and then mountain lands. And it's simply, these are all probably a similar erosion surface, not something older and younger, but basically this was softer, this was harder. Um, the western boundary is a whole pile of mountains. You can see the high mountains in the background. We were on the other side of that valley before. And now this is the coastal plain that extends behind me towards the ocean. Here, for example, is another effect in lithology. These rocks are part of the upper part of the uh, Garib stratigraphy, but the basement and the younger part, uh, the older, oh, I'm talking start, start again. These are younger parts of the Pan-African stratigraphy. This is the older part of the Pan-African stratigraphy, which are quartzites. So basically this mountain is a resistant caused by the harder nature of the quartzites compared to the carbonates. Um, the, the Kubus escarpment 
is basically a place where the coastal plain got to. And so these were probably ancient um, sort of sea cliffs. But with fans that have had base level changes to give rise to their subsequent erosion. And these sort of base level changes are critical for the alluvial terraces in the lower orange and the, and the diamonds and, of course, the marine benches. Here's a uh, friend, some of you probably know, this is Moose Kruger at a very young age. He's sitting on the top of Kubis and we can see the Atlantic Ocean in the distance. And this is the edge of the escarpment in the Rickersfeld looking out to the western coastal plain. This is from the coastal plain looking back up to the top of Kubis and this granite barrier. All this is granite, but this is a cliff that's actually planed off half of the granite pluton. So you've got to argue that there must have been some serious uh, escarpment retreat and quite strong erosion uh, during that time. The reactivation, the base levels, and the, and the timing of the marine, ter marine terraces and the alluvial terraces are all linked to this uh, fan degradation. And again, would be very interesting to study. Um, we're now at Aronument, looking back to that, the western margin of the coastal plain. And we know the Orange River goes out to Aronument behind me. And of course, in that area, you have these spectacular uh, exposures of the uh, ancestral orange and all the diamonds in the sort of various parts of the strath. Um, we have the chance back in the day when it was active to go in. You can see these potholes in the ancestral orange. And these are the glory holes for the high carat and the high value diamonds. And of course, this was all your pockets were emptied when you left this place. Um, there's a, someone can do five PhDs just on the Orange River mouth. This is a Ramsar site because of the back barrier beach lagoon. Uh, this is during a normal, normal day. Uh, the Ramsar site, of course, has its own interesting combination of brackish water, seawater, and, and of course this is sea wash. Waves brush over and go and mix with the river waters and all sorts of interesting ecological things there. But on occasion you get the 100 year flood where the orange just sort of disregards everything. This part, I think this is in 1974, the water went straight over the top of the Garib Dam. It took away the Coffer Dam of the PK Larue. It washed away all the rivers at Uppington. It washed everything down. There, the um, Oppenheimer Bridge was covered with water and the whole um, sort of barrier beach was washed away. Um, normal river is about here somewhere. This is a 1974 Ronyman. This was a, was a riverside town. Was, you know, Ronyman is way in the middle of the desert. Um, of course, part of the geoheritage, of course, is the, is the, um, the mining activity. It's a bone of contention with some people. The money didn't actually go to the people that should have got it. Um, a lot of this is now um, needs to be rehabilitated um, and so on. But certainly the diamond mining is now almost becoming history. And uh, it, should be, it should be sort of kept current. Um, the, the honor students of the day had the chance to go into these, um, into these basal marine uh, gravels right down to the bedrock and look for the trap sites so these kids could actually go in, see the bedrock, and um, the nice thing about this Aronium formation, which is the latest part of the Garib, is that they have this fissile nature and generates a serious number of trap sites, structurally controlled and surface controlled. So the, the so-called geoheritage story is so far successful, but there's a significant chunk of the Richtersfeld which is privately owned or state, parastatal, in limbo. Um, there's a variety of funny trusts and so on. Uh, there's still a little bit of diming, but there's, there's a lot of future. Uh, it could look bright or it could look gloomy. But certainly, because you've got the Nama Desert Park to one side, it's not impossible that the future, and obviously people like us, geologists as others, uh, are being sort of counseled by decision makers. That, do we need another sand park? Do we need another have a world heritage site? What do we need to do to preserve the heritage of this sort of area? And again, some of you may be more socially minded than others and may be more interested in that type of um, decision process. Now, you may find in all ecotourism, you talk about a lunar landscape on Earth, a Martian landscape. And I had to sort of make some comments about it in one of my book's chapters. This is a picture that reminded me of a picture that Pierre took just outside Craddock. I mean, these could all be sort of, you know, the Beaufort. Well... I don't think there's any fossils in these rocks on Mars. 
because there's a debate as to whether or not these rocks look very much like the crew and not possibly three billion years old. There's something for the future to sort of go up there. Maybe you'll be the first geologist to go and start working these Karoo-looking Martian rocks. There's a lot of student activities. Um, obviously, in the lab, and then this poor young girl had to come down the river and jump into an honors project. And some of the others from previous sites have all um, sort of gone on to do greater and better things. But perhaps the most insightful comment I had from this guy here he was a third year student who came down the orange with me with first year students, second year students, third year students, honor students, MSCs, PhDs, and staff. As you know, and when you come up through undergrad, you have the first year trip, the second year trip, third year trip. This is more vertical. And he made an insightful comment. He said, you know, the nice thing about this group is everybody wants to be here. And he said, well, the implication is that during your first year, yeah, there are people here that When's lunch? When are we going home? Are we there yet? Um, and so all I can say is that something like the Rickersfield, which I'm sure there's analogies elsewhere, that make a vertical type of field trip rather than a one-off because there'll be people there and not interested. So anyway, there's so many questions and so few answers that I'll get by with a little help from my friends. Thanks very much. <laughs>
ring fenced. Um, a lot of that is what we call cultural pastoral land. And um, again, you just use your own internal, do not drive off the road, and do not sort of deface the environment. Ask people if you want to take a sample and a fossil, go through the channels. Uh, in that case, thank you so much, Dave. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah. I just want to show you one thing. We, we have our usual Thursday job talk tomorrow. Uh, it's a topic that I think will excite all of us. It has to do with the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that will be given uh, by me. And we also have more talks that will be coming. But for tomorrow, I'll be happy if all of you can make it because I'm going to make sure that it's quite exciting and you also live with something that can help you formulate your own projects. Thank you. Okay.